Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira. For the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events to have happened around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. Doklam standoff continues. China warns India says restraint has bottom line. President Xi Jinping says Beijing will never compromise on its sovereignty and security. India said it is coordinating with Bhutan on the issue. U.S. President signs Russian sanctions into law with caveats. Uh, Moscow calls it an all-out trade war. Move also irks European nations. Trump warns of dangerous low in Russia relations. Venezuela's president heading towards a showdown with his political foes. Leaders of the opposition urge Venezuelans to fill the streets of the capital. World leaders call on Maduro to suspend constitutional assembly. UN human rights investigators warn of ethnic cleansing in central Congo. UN bases its new report on interviews in June of 96 people who fled Congo's Kasai provinces into neighboring Angola. 80 mass graves identified in the troubled region. Neymar signs PSG deal to complete world record transfer. Striker joins Paris Saint-Germain from Barcelona for a whopping $263 million. Brazilian to get a weekly salary of $653,000. Our top focus on the program this week, China will never compromise on its sovereignty and security. Chinese President Xi Jinping said this on Tuesday at an Army Day celebration. Although his statement was not directed at anyone in particular, the timing indicates it was aimed at India since troops of both countries are locked in a bitter standoff at the border in Sikkim. face-off between India and China enters the third month, the longest since 1962, Chinese President Xi Jinping issued a veiled threat to India, claiming that China won't allow anyone to split its territory. He was speaking at the 90th founding anniversary of the People's Liberation Army, where he asserted that the Chinese army had the resolve to defeat all invasions. The Chinese people love peace. We'll never seek aggression or expansion, but we have the confidence to defeat all invasions. We'll never allow any people, organization or political party to split any part of Chinese territory out of the country at any time, in any form. Although President Xi did not make a direct reference to the Sikkim standoff, he urged the PLA to forge an elite and powerful force that's always ready to fight capable of combat and sure to win. No one should expect us to swallow a bit of fruit that is harmful to our sovereignty, security or development interests. The People's Army should firmly safeguard the CPC's leadership and the socialist system, protect national sovereignty, security and development interest as well as regional and world peace. The Chinese president's remarks come barely a week after National Security Advisor Ajit Doval held talks with the Chinese leadership on the border standoff. Both countries, however, have not said anything about the outcome of the high-level talks. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, joining me for a chat to talk about this is Sanjay Kapoor, editor of The Hard News. Welcome and thank you for joining me on the program. You know, this Doklam standoff has been going on for over two months now and it doesn't look like there's an end in sight. The rhetoric on China's side is extremely high. India also trying to, you know, somehow uh, dissolve the issue, talking about diplomatic channels, uh, the uh, external affairs minister and even the prime minister, you know, making references to this particular issue. What's likely to happen? You know, it's indeed a very tricky situation, the kind which we haven't really seen uh, in the last, uh, since independence. Although there was a war in 1962 when we know really what happened during that time. 
but this doklam standoff is unique in a certain way that you have indian uh, present in a third country and that is what is rankling china quite a bit they are saying that they are occupying space in their country and uh, you heard the uh, the speech of president xi jinping you heard even the plo defense minister everybody they are saying that we're going to overthrow the indians in fact there is a PTI uh, report which has come out today which says that in matter of two weeks they will uh, you know, mount an uh, operation to remove Indian soldiers from here. So all this looks rather grim and it would be uh, very harmful if uh, there is actually a war or there is yeah, some kind of hostility at the border. Primarily because both the two Asian countries have, uh, you know, have surprised the world by their growth. They are in a position to change the entire world order. And a war between two of them would really bring everything down. China is not going to be um, well off, nor India. And both the economies would be ba badly impacted. If you look at it, you know, the, you have a trade of about 70 to $80 billion, which is rising. This is the direct trade between them. And then you have indirect trade also between them. So the economy will be really badly impacted. And uh, China's uh, promise of uh, a very peaceful rise to uh, greatness, all that impression would be defeated. Then you have the Belt and Road Initiative, which China has initiated uh, for quite a while, and they think that th that will, in a certain way, revive the world economy. That will greatly get hurt, primarily because uh, India is not part of it. And on top you know, of that, talk, talking about that initiative, you know, that's very crucial as far as the Chinese are concerned, and India's cooperation is also very important for the Chinese because let's not forget that most of uh, China's energy needs go through the Indian Ocean. And if India, you know, at some point in time does something about that and uh, the Malacca Strait is blocked for China, that is going to be a major concern for the Chinese. I think there is a lot China will lose uh, if they decide to take on India, if they uh, give shape to the threats that they are making. Uh, India has been behaving as with certain kind of maturity. They are uh, keeping quiet. They are not uh, matching uh, all the harsh words that China is spewing at the moment. But uh, there is a lot to be lost for both the countries and primarily China because there is so much that China wants to do in terms of uh, stamping its authority in different parts of the world, whether their expansion in Africa, whether they want to do more in Asia. You look at how they have uh, struck deals in Nepal, in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka. There is a lot that they are, they are doing at the moment. And all that will come uh, at a huge price if uh, they can't uh, resolve this matter. Similarly for India, India will also get hurt. So I think it will be in the interest of both the countries to find a way to do that. India you has been trying to talk with Bhutan, you know, sure. because the, the prize is Bhutan. Bhutan is the only country uh, besides India which has not signed the Bol Belt and Road Initiative. And India is supposed to look after the security and uh, the foreign policy to some extent. And uh, Chinese have been trying to stoke uh, nationalist feeling among Bhutanese by suggesting that in, in, in India treats them like their colony. So these are very tricky areas and uh, much of uh, what really happens will determine how, what Bhutan does or how Bhutan emerges out. Because there are two elephants who are fighting and they always fear the grass will get trampled and these sure. small countries worry from that standpoint. Yeah, you know, very quickly, but there's so much that China has said about Doklam. There's so much of rhetoric on, from China's side, beat the media, beat the, the president and even the defense minister and everyone else is speaking about it. So is there a, a middle path that China can really take as far as this issue is concerned? I mean, uh, China has been ins insisting that they will only talk that if, if India withdraws troops. And they have begun to spread this, uh, I would say, news that we started off with 14, uh, 400 uh, soldiers and have brought down to 48 and uh, if they, they have to go away. But uh, the only way in my reckoning is when Bhutan comes into some kind of role. Bhutan has to actually tell India that uh, we will negotiate because what uh, Bhutan and uh, China have been engaged for quite a while, about 24 rounds of talk have taken place between the two countries and uh, Bhutan's auto uh, you know, uh, sovereignty uh, is demanding to assert sure. itself sure. and India has to somehow look after its security. They also need to look after a small country which they have promised to look up. So it's a tricky thing. So in a certain way, India has to build up uh, Bhutan to take a certain step and on advice of Bhutan, they may actually go back and uh, the peace could be restored. Okay. If it doesn't get restored, we don't know what is going to happen. Indeed. All right. Uh, thank you, Sanjay Kapoor, for joining us on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Well, moving on now, U.S. President Donald Trump grudgingly signed into law new sanctions against Russia on Wednesday, a move Moscow said amounted to a full-scale trade war and an end to hopes of better ties with the Trump administration. 
Congress overwhelmingly approved the legislation last week, passing a measure that conflicts with the Republican president's desire to improve relations with Moscow. U.S. President Donald Trump signed a legislation imposing new sanctions on Russia into law. The U.S. Congress voted last week by overwhelming margins for sanctions to punish the Russian government over interference in the 2016 presidential election, annexation of Ukraine's Crimea and other perceived violations of international norms. This morning, the president signed uh, the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. The president favors tough measures to punish and deter the bad behavior of the rogue regimes in Iran and North Korea. And he also sent a clear signal that we won't tolerate interference in our democratic process by Russia. The bill was improved, but Congress has encroached on the power of the presidency, and he signed it in the interest of national unity. Uh, we've been very clear that we support tough sanctions on all three of those countries. We continue to do so, uh, and that has certainly not changed, and I think that was reflected in the statements today. Trump, who has made it clear he wanted to improve relations with Russia, grudgingly accepted the new congressional sanctions, which also included Iran and North Korea. The bill had enough support in Congress to override a presidential veto. President Trump really had no choice but to sign the sanctions bill for two reasons. The first is that given the suspicions of collusion between his administration and the Russian government during the 2016 campaign, uh, for him to have vetoed the bill would have simply sent those suspicions into overdrive and caused significant political damage. The other and, and more pragmatic reason is simply that the bill passed by veto-proof majorities in both the House and the Senate. So he could have vetoed it, but it simply would have been passed into law regardless over his objections. Trump's signing of the bill followed some conflicting signals from the administration in recent days about the sanctions. Meanwhile, experts believe the new sanctions will worsen U.S.-Russia relations. What do the sanctions do? They take very bad re relations between the U.S. and Russia and make them even worse. But they do something else as well. They also deteriorate U.S. relations with Europe because the U.S. economic sanctions are really punishing Europe for having trade and economic activity with Russia. Russians feel the pain. Europeans feel the pain. And so you have American politicians in Congress using the pain of other people as a political football. It's, in fact, the worst kind of opportunism. Moscow was unhappy with the move and said it amounted to a full-scale trade war and an end to hopes for better ties with the Trump administration. Russian Prime Minister Mitri Medvedev wrote in a Facebook post and on Twitter that the Trump administration had demonstrated total weakness. It is harming our relations inevitably, but uh, but uh, we will be working in conditions uh, that that exist, and in the hope that uh, uh, it will uh, turn one day. Uh, but uh, those who who invented uh, this bill, uh, if they were thinking that they might change our policy, uh, they were wrong, as history uh, many times proved. Uh, they should have known better that we do not bend or do not break. Besides angering the legislation has also upset the European Union, which has said the new sanctions might affect its energy security and prompt it to retaliate if needed. Several provisions of the law target the Russian energy sector with new limits on U.S. investment in Russian companies. American companies also would be barred from participating in energy exploration projects where Russian firms have a stake of 33% or higher. The legislation includes sanctions on foreign companies investing in or helping Russian energy exploration, although the president could waive those sanctions. It would give the Trump administration the option of imposing sanctions on companies helping develop Russian export pipelines, such as the Nord Stream 2 pipeline carrying natural gas to Europe, in which German companies are involved. Bureau Report, Raju Sabatini. Well, it's time for a short break now, but still to come, UN report says over 250 people killed in ethnic-based massacres in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Survivors speak of hearing the screams of people being burned alive and of seeing loved ones chased and cut down. That and much more on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Hello and welcome. I'm Amrit Anshara and you're watching Law of the Land. The mission of this government is to double the farmer's income in six years' time. So you have a strong linkage between agriculture and industry. Watch Law of the Land on Rajya Sabha Television. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, amid political turmoil in Venezuela, President Maduro began a crackdown on opposition leaders. Two opposition leaders, both already under house arrest, were detained in a dramatic fashion on Monday night. Meanwhile, Venezuela's controversial new assembly has opened despite fierce opposition at home and abroad. Venezuela's leading opposition figures were taken from their homes in the middle of the night by state security agents early on Tuesday. The wife of opposition leader Leopoldo Lopez posted what appeared to be a video of him being taken from their home after midnight. Another video purportedly showed former Caracas mayor Antonio Ledesma being taken by state security. Lopez was under house arrest, serving out his sentence after being charged with inciting protesters to violence three years ago. Ledesma, too, was detained in 2015 and has been under house arrest. The two have recently been vocal in denouncing President Nicolas Maduro's decision to hold a vote for a constituent assembly. The U.S. placed sanctions on Maduro after the vote was held, even as the Venezuelan president dismissed them. El gobierno del emperador Donald Trump. The U.S. don't intimidate me. The threats and sanctions from the imperialist don't intimidate me one bit in this world. In this world, I'm not afraid of anything. I don't fear God. I love God. I have nothing to fear from God because he loves me and I love him. Washington's financial sanctions against Maduro came after electoral officers said more than 8 million people voted Sunday to create the Constituent Assembly. Opposition leaders estimated the real turnout at less than half the government's claim. The Constituent Assembly is tasked with rewriting the country's constitution and is set to begin governing this week. Among other measures, the Assembly's powers could be used to bar opposition candidates from running in gubernatorial elections in December, unless they sit with the ruling party to negotiate an end to hostilities that have generated four months of protests, killing at least 120 and wounding nearly 2,000. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, the UN said more than 250 people, including 62 children, have been killed in attacks in the Democratic Republic of Congo that are taking on an increasing and disturbing ethnic dimension. In a report based on interviews with almost 100 victims, the UN's Human Rights Office said it believed the DRC government was complicit in the massacres in the southwestern Kasai province. UN investigators on Friday said that a militia group blamed for atrocities in Congo is largely composed of children, while a militia formed to defeat it is suspected of a campaign of ethnically based massacres and rapes. Between March and June uh, of this year, uh, our team documented a large number of killings, uh, 251 killings of individuals, um, a large number, large number of them children. Uh, 62 of the cases were of children that were killed um, in the context uh, of a crisis and uh, attacks going out on an ethnic basis um, but with government complicity so with state forces involved in in organizing backing one of the ethnic-based militias that have been carrying out attacks 
A report detailing violence that the UN said may amount to crimes against humanity shines a light onto the role of children in a disturbing conflict that has killed thousands. It was based on testimonies from people who had fled from the violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo to Angola. The primary source of information was from direct victims and witnesses of, of what took place. Uh, so our team carried out interviews in refugee camps, um, in hospitals with people that showed the signs uh, of, of physical harm. Many of them had horrific stories um, to tell, uh, including of children uh, having their limbs chopped off, um, of people being hacked uh, with, with machetes. Um, one attack in the village uh, of Sink, uh, where 90 people um, were killed uh, in the hospital. In a statement, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said, the accounts should serve as a grave warning to the government of the DRC to act now to prevent such violence from tipping into wider ethnic cleansing. I call on the government to take all necessary measures to fulfill its primary obligation to protect people from all ethnic backgrounds in the greater Kasai area. The UN report said one militia group, the Kamuina Nasapu, has been fighting Congo's government for a year and has summarily executed at least 79 people. A great majority of the group's elements are children, some as young as seven. The refugees were convinced that the militia group had magical powers and militia members believed their magic, including young girls drinking the blood of decapitated victims, would make them invincible. A second militia group, the Banamura, was formed in March or April, allegedly armed and supported by local leaders and officials from the army and the police to attack the Luba and Lulua ethnic groups to which the Kamuina Nasapur fighters belong. The Banamura was often accompanied by Congolese soldiers who were responsible for atrocities, including firing rockets into a church in the village of Jiboko on 10th June, killing 60 to 90 people attending a religious service. One very disturbing finding uh, that our team noted on the ground was victims uh, and witnesses again and again mentioned that uh, when their village was attacked, um, the attackers coming from one ethnic group were often accompanied by either police uh, or local officials or officials from the army, um, and that they claimed that local officials, uh, government agents had been involved in the planning and sometimes the actual carrying out uh, of the attacks or in providing arms um, to one of the ethnic groups. In one attack on a village, the Banamura shot, chopped up and disemboweled people. Many were beheaded or burned alive, including the patients in a health center. A woman still bleeding from childbirth was raped with the barrel of a rifle. After a Banamura attack on another village, one witness claimed to have buried 45 decapitated bodies, the UN has identified 80 mass graves in the Kasai's region. Bureau Report, Raja Sabha TV. Well, let's now shift focus and bring you up to speed with all the sports news you might have missed this week in sports action. Neymar's world record move to Paris Saint-Germain was completed on Thursday when the French club confirmed the Brazilian superstar had signed a five-year deal, earning him an estimated 30 million euros a year. The deal was signed just hours after the 25-year-old paid off his 222 million euro buyout clause to Barcelona. The transfer has more than doubled the previous world record set by Manchester United's capture of Paul Pogba from Juventus last year for 105 million euros, leaving many commentators aghast at the rampant inflation in football transfer fees. Leading coaches such as Arsenal's Arsene Wenger and Manchester United's Jose Mourinho lamented that the move could cause even greater inflation in transfer fees and player wages. Usain Bolt is confident he can produce one more magical Midas touch when he seeks to defend his 100 meters title at the IAF World Championships. In eight individual finals at the past four Worlds, Bolt has only suffered one hiccup when he false started in the 100 meters final in Daegu in 2011. 11 world titles to go along with the eight uh, Olympic golds, Bolt has the experience of dealing with multi-round big event racing. Whilst labelling himself for some reason the underdog, Bolt fired out a warning shot at potential rivals by saying he wanted to bring the curtain down on his individual exploits as a sprinter who was unbeatable, unstoppable. 
World number one Andy Murray and sixth ranked Wimbledon finalist Marin Cilic have withdrawn from next week's ATP Rogers Cup in Montreal. A nagging hip injury will keep Murray away from the Canadian hardcourt tune-up for the US Open for the second year in a row after 11 previous consecutive appearances by the 30-year-old Scotsman. Cilic, whose best Canada showing was a 2008 quarter-final run, has a nagging adductor injury and joined Murray and fourth-seeded Stan Wawrinka on the sidelines. Wawrinka pulled out on Wednesday with a knee injury. Spanish motorcycling legend Angel Nieto died on Thursday, age 70, just over a week after suffering a quad bike crash in Ibiza. Nieto was on a quad bike on Wednesday last week when he had an accident with a tourism vehicle. He was rushed to hospital in a serious state where he remained in intensive care, but his condition deteriorated before passing away. Nieto sits second in the all-time list of most motorcycling world championship titles, two behind Italian great Giacomo Agostini. Only Agostini and current Italy great Valentino Rossi have bettered his tally of 90 Grand Prix victories. British heavyweight Anthony Joshua has been ordered by the WBA to defend his title against Cuba's Luis Ortiz. The 27-year-old had been due to face Vladimir Klitschko in a rematch before the Ukrainian retired on Thursday. The WBA says Joshua and Ortiz have 30 days from 3rd August to agree on the fight. Joshua, who beat Klitschko at Wembley in April, has also been told he must face IBF mandatory challenger Kubrat Pulev before December 2nd or risk being stripped of his belt. And finally, inspired by Rudyard Kipling's famous fables, the Concrete Jungle Book offers a gritty outlook on life where tigers and forests have been replaced by homeless people and refugees struggling to survive in an urban jungle filled with drugs and knife crime. The brainchild of British writer-director Dominic Garfield, who also plays the central character Mowgli in the musical, opened on Friday at Edinburgh's famous Fringe Festival. I'm going to leave you with these visuals from Scotland, until next time, this is Frank Pereira signing off. Excuse me, what's your name? That's not expected to be paid. So you are until the baby cries, peaceful screams. For a minute, the village forget gorillas and they dream. Big mom wake the van moving, baby picking up a fuck and puking. Have to be loud and we you need to hoot. Teach of the love in the jungle. Teach what's gonna come and what's gonna be. Teach of the what you can of the king of the fuck. Who can I trust and who can I know? Who's gonna teach you and who's gonna flush? But who's got the knowledge?